Hello students and welcome to lecture 6 on atoms, ions, and moles. Let's first discuss something called net charge. Net charge, you'll learn, um, relates to the overall charge of an ion. You'll learn what an ion means in a minute. But net charge depends on the number of protons and electrons in an ion. The equation for net charge is net charge is equal to the number of protons minus the number of electrons. The reason why is because for charge, the only two things that carry any charge are protons and electrons while neutrons carry no charge. So you just focus on the number of protons and number of electrons. And if you want to find the net charge, you have to add the number of protons and the number of electrons. Notice that each proton carries a plus one charge and each electron carries a minus one charge. So you're adding the positive protons total charge and the negative electrons total charge. So in essence, you're doing protons minus electrons anyway. All right, so let's try some examples here of calculating net charge, which equals, as you should know, number of protons minus electrons. All right, so. Example 1 says find the number of electrons in a neutral boron atom with 5 protons and 6 neutrons. Let's remember that since this is a, new, this is a neutral atom that the number of protons equals the number of electrons. If we look here, you have 5 protons. Since you have 5 protons and this is a neutral atom, we know that there are also 5 electrons. Because again, atoms have the same number of protons and electrons as you learned in the last lesson. Example 2 says find the net charge of an atom with 6 protons, 10 electrons, 7 neutrons. Again, we just plug into net charge equals protons minus electrons, so we plug in 6 protons minus 10 electrons gives us a net charge of minus 4. All right, the third example, I want you to change the word atom to ion. Find the net charge of an ion with 12 protons and 10 electrons. You said to plug into charge equals number of protons minus number of electrons, so if you plug in, you get 12 protons minus 10 electrons, gives you a net charge of plus 2 for this ion. All right, now let's discuss what atoms are versus what ions are. We know neutral atoms have a net charge of zero overall because the number of protons and electrons are equal. But let's remember the nuclear charge is always still positive because the only things that contribute any charge in the nucleus are the protons. All right, so for example, a boron atom is electrically neutral, we know, because it has the same number of protons and electrons. Specifically, we know as five protons, five electrons, just based on its atomic number and the fact that it is a neutral atom. So this example says, find the charge of an atom with seven protons, seven neutrons, seven electrons. Since we're at to find the charge of the whole atom and not the nucleus, we know that the charge of an atom is zero overall because the number of protons and electrons are equal. That's the official explanation. The other way to think about this, this is not something you should ever write in the test, but you should know that the positive charges from the protons and the negative charges from the electrons cancel each other out if they're the same number of protons and electrons. All right, next we have ions. Ions, you should know, are charged forms of atoms or groups of atoms. And the reason why the atom or group of atoms is charged is because the number of protons and electrons are not equal. In ions, I also want you to note that only the number of electrons changes, nothing else. You only change the electrons when you form an ion. So the number of protons and electrons are not equal because only the number of electrons changes to throw that uh, charge off balance, basically. All right, now electrons are either lost or gained to form an ion, which you'll learn in a second. Now let's discuss how to represent atoms and ions. For every atom or ion, you'll always have a, an element symbol first, which is a symbol that represents an element, followed by a charge, which is a superscript to the top right of the element symbol that represents the atom or ion's charge. And for the um, charge, generally, if the charge is positive or negative, that will tell you that you have an ion. On the other hand, if you have no superscript, then that tells you that you have a neutral atom, because you can imply that the charge is zero. For example, with Na, you know that you have sodium or Na, because that's a symbol for sodium. And specifically, since there's no charge there, you know you have a neutral atom because that not having a charge means it's neutral, meaning in other words, mathematically, is a charge of zero. On the other hand, this O2 minus is uh, represented as an ion as follows. O represents an oxygen, oxygen, the element. But since it's an ion, as shown by the two minus charge, you know that is specifically actually something called an oxide ion. It's an oxide ion because it has a charge of negative two. Okay? So it's an oxide ion because it has a charge, and specifically, the charge that follows it with the superscript to the right is a charge of negative two. If we look at another one, for example, Xe is the symbol for um, xenon, so that's the element symbol, and since there's no charge there, you can assume that this is a neutral atom with, of xenon with the charge of zero. Yet another example of um, an ion would be um, if we did SR2+, plus, where the element symbol SR represents the element strontium, if you look at them on table S, and the charge 2 plus tells you that you have an ion. Specifically, the charge of the ion is 2 plus, since that's the charge there. Now let's discuss the two types of ions, cations and anions. 
First, we have cations, and cations are ions with a positive charge that form when metal atoms lose electrons. You know from the last lesson that metals are left at the steps in the periodic table. So to find the number of electrons in cations, you have to take um, the number of ions, positive charge from the cation, and subtract that charge's number from the number um, of electrons in the neutral atom. Okay, so let's try an example here so you know what I mean. We know Mg is a metal since it's to the left of the steps on the periodic table. So we know that since it's a metal atom to form an ion, it must lose electrons to form a positive char positively charged cation, right? And let's see how that works right now. Um, so uh, in a neutral Mg atom, we know that the atomic number of 12 for Mg tells us the number of protons and electrons, since the number of protons and electrons are the same in neutral atoms. So we have, um, in this case, 12 protons and 12 electrons in the neutral Mg atom based on Mg's atomic number of 12. Now if we form an Mg2 plus ion with the charge of 2 plus, the plus charge here tells us that electrons are lost by the neutral Mg metal atom as metal atoms do when they form cations. And the 2, the two more specifically tells us that we lose 2 electrons from the metal Mg atom to form Mg2 plus as an ion. So we have to take the number of electrons in the neutral atom, which we found out was 12, subtract 2, which is the charge's number, and the 2 plus ion, so that we can form the Mg2 plus cation. So this gives us 12 minus 2, or 10 electrons, in Mg2 plus. Note here that the number of protons stays the same no matter what, because let's remember, as long as you have the same element, you must have the, um, the same atomic number and the same number of protons. Okay? Next up, we have anions, and anions are ions with a negative charge that form when nonmetal atoms gain electrons. You know from the last lesson that nonmetals are right at the steps on the periodic table. So to find the number of electrons in anions, here's what you need to do. Uh, you need to take the number of the uh, anion's negative charge and add that charge's number to the number of electrons in the neutral atom to find out how many electrons there actually are in the anion itself. So let's try an example here so you get a better sense of this. We know O is a nonmetal since it's to the right of the steps. And in a neutral O nonmetal atom, we know that the atomic number of 8 for O tells us the number of protons as well as the number of electrons, since the number of protons and electrons are the same in any neutral atom. So based on the atomic number of 8, we know that we also have 8 protons and 8 electrons in that neutral atom of O. All right, now, if we form an O2 minus anion with the charge of 2 minus, the minus in the ion's charge tells us that electrons are gained by the neutral O atom, as nonmetal atoms tend to do when they form anions. And the 2 more specifically tells us that we gain 2 electrons to form O2 minus. So we have to take the number of electrons in the neutral atom, which was 8, and then add 2 based on the charge's number of, of 2 in the 2 minus charge, giving you 8 plus 2, or 10 electrons in the O2 minus anion. And notice here that the number of protons still stays the same, because as long as you have the same element, you must always have the same number of protons in the same atomic number no matter what. Okay, now let's practice finding the number of subatomic particles in that charge, the atomic number and nuclear charge for each of these. Before we start, remember that atomic number and the number of protons are the same for both atoms and ions of any element, since these two numbers always identify what the element is. By extension, since nuclear charge equals the number of protons, with the positive sign at the end, nuclear charge is also the same for atoms and ions of a specific element. Since there's no mass number given for any of these, uh, make sure you round the element's atomic mass in the top left corner of the periodic table box to a whole number, and then make sure you subtract the mass number minus the atomic number to find the number of neutrons. The only quantity also that changes for ions is the number of electrons, all right? So let's do this one by one. So for V, um, the atomic number is 23. Since this is an atom, we also know that the atomic number 23 equals the number of protons, so we have 23 protons, and it also equals the number of electrons, which is 23. Since uh, for each atom, the number of protons and electrons must be equal to make the atom neutral. The mass number for V, since not given, is approximated as 51 by rounding the atomic mass from the periodic table. So the number of neutrons equals the 51 approximated mass number for V minus the atomic number 23 giving us uh, 51 minus 23, or 28 neutrons. All right, the net charge for any atom we know is zero. And uh, the nuclear charge equals 28 plus, since we have 28 protons, so we just add a plus sign at the end to get 28 plus as a nuclear charge. And this is obviously an atom, since it carries no net charge and is neutral overall. Now for Al3+, plus, the atomic number is 13, since it's still aluminum, so it still has the same atomic number for aluminum. The number of protons also equals the atomic number 13. And since this is Al, however, we 
have to change the number of electrons. The three plus here tells us that we subtract three electrons from the number of electrons in the neutral atom. As a trick, we know the number of electrons in the neutral Al atom equals the atomic number of 13 from before. So to find the number of electrons in the Al3+, plus, take 13, the number of electrons in the neutral Al atom, and subtract three since three plus means we lose uh, three electrons. That yields 13 minus three, or 10 electrons in Al3+. Plus. The number of neutrons, now we know, equals um, Al's atomic mass, uh, rounded from the periodic table to 27 as a mass number, minus Al's atomic number of 13, giving us 27 minus 13 or 14 neutrons here. All right, um, now uh, we know that the net charge here equals 13 protons minus 10 electrons, giving us 3 plus. The nuclear charge we know equals the number of protons 13 with the plus at the end, so the nuclear charge is 13 plus. And this is a cation since it's a positively charged ion, okay? Now for I minus, uh, the atomic number is 53 since it's still iodine. And the number of protons also equals the atomic number, so the number of protons is 53. Since this is I minus though, we have to change the number of electrons. One minus specifically tells us that we must add one electron to the number of electrons in the neutral atom. As a trick, we know the number of electrons in the neutral I atom equals its atomic number 53. So we take this atomic number 53, as the number of electrons in the I atom, and then we have to um, add one since the one minus charge means you gain one electron. So that gives you 51 plus, sorry, 53 plus one or 54 electrons in I minus as an ion. The number of electrons equals um, I's atomic mass rounded from the periodic table to 127 as a mass number, minus I's atomic number of 53 yielding 127 minus 53 or 74 neutrons. The net charge here equals 54, 53 protons minus 54 electrons, giving you one minus as the net charge. Um, the nuclear charge is equal to the number of protons, which is 53 with the plus at the end, so you get 53 plus as the nuclear charge. And since this is a negative um, ion with a negative net charge, this is an anion. These you can copy down your own. And these are the answers to the other questions. All right, um, how Mg2 plus and S2 minus form differently is Mg2 plus forms when an Mg metal atom loses two electrons based on the two plus charge, leading to less electrons in the ion compared to the atom. All right, S2 minus, on the other hand, since, an, since it's a non-metal ion, forms when an S atom gains two electrons as implied by the two minus charge, therefore leading to more electrons in the ion compared to the atom. All right, these are really redundant. You can just look over those on your own, okay? Finally, let's go over moles. Moles are the number of atoms that you would find in 12 grams of carbon-12 or C12. And this number of atoms in 12 grams of C12 or carbon-12 represents the amount or number of particles you have. Generally, one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, meaning 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particle, uh, ions, sorry, depending on which one of these three you're discussing. All right, one mole also equals uh, 22.4 liters as a volume at what's known as standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin, and standard pressure is known as one ATM, 101.3 kPa or 760 uh, millimeters of Hg, which you can all look up on table A on your own, in your reference table, so please make sure you look at that, all right? Two conversion factors that you have to use to convert between moles, the number of particles, and volume at STP are the following, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles over one mole, and the other conversion factor you need to know is 22.4 liters at SCP over one mole. So make sure you memorize these conversion factors so that you can convert between um, moles, liters at STP of gas, as well as the number of particles. All right, so this first question asks us, let's try some examples. How many atoms of Fe are there in 1.69 moles? So we start off with 1.69 moles. If we want to convert to atoms or particles from moles, what we have to do is we need to use this conversion factor because we got to cancel out this moles in the numerator. So in the conversion factor, we have to put moles in the denominator so that the numerator here and the denominator of the conversion factor cancel out. So if you do that, these two cancel out, and you just multiply 1.69 times this, and you get 1.02 times 10 to the 24th atoms in 1.69 moles, all right? So this next question says, how many moles of H2S are there in 1.26 times 10 to the 27th molecules of H2S? So you start out with um, 1.26 times 10 to the 27th molecules of H2S, and you have to convert to moles, right? So you want to get from molecules to moles. Molecules are just another way of saying particles. So what we need to do is we need to cancel out this molecules in the numerator by putting it in the denominator of the conversion factor so that it cancels out. And we have to put moles in the numerator because that's what we want in our answer. So what we have to do is we have to flip this conversion factor and multiply this number by um, one mole over 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. If we do that, the molecules in the numerator, the original number, and the denominator of the conversion factor cancel out, and you only have moles left. So you do this number 
times one divided by this on the bottom, and you get 2,092 moles of H2S, okay? So in this third example, we have to convert 4.46 liters of neon gas to STP to moles of neon gas. So let's start out by writing 4.46 liters of neon as the numerator of the original number. Now what we have to do here is we have to use a conversion factor that includes liters and moles so we can convert between them. The, this second conversion factor is the one that includes liters and moles, so we use this to convert to moles. But we have a problem. This conversion factor is liters in the numerator and moles in the denominator. That's wrong because if you multiply liters by the liters on top here, you just get liters squared over moles. So obviously you don't want that, you want moles on the top because that's what you want in the numerator. So what we have to do is flip this conversion factor and multiply it by this liters in the numerator so that the liters cancel out and you have moles in the top. It looks like this, where you have liters in the denominator, moles in the numerator, so that the liters in the original numerator and the liters in the denominator of the conversion factor cancel out, only leaving moles. Now all you have to do to find the number of moles is just do 4.46 divided by 2.24, giving you 1.99 moles of NE. All right, this last question says find the volume of 1.39 moles of N2 gas. So we start with 1.39 moles of N2 gas in the numerator, and we have to convert it to volume. And let's assume, by the way, that this is at STP. So the problem here is we have moles, but we have to convert to volume. How do we do that? We have to use whichever conversion factor includes a unit for, for volume, which would be in liters and moles. The second conversion factor is what's involved because that includes the two necessary units. Now we have to make the conversion, this conversion factor in a way that moles is in the denominator in the conversion factor because that will cancel out moles in the original number. If you look, this already is set up the way we want it to because moles is already in the denominator. So if we multiply this, number of moles by this conversion factor, the moles in the numerator of the original number and moles in the denominator of the conversion factor will cancel out just leaving liters, which is what we want. So let's just do that. And we do that moles in the original numerator and moles in the denominator of the conversion factor cancel out. And all I have to do to find the liter, you're left with liters in the top, so all I have to do to find the number of liters total is just multiply 1.39 by 22.4, giving you 31.1 liters of N2 gas here. Okay, this is straight up just using conversion factors. All right, finally, let's talk about coefficients in moles. Um, here you have reaction N2 gas plus 3H2 gas produces 2H3 gas, right? Coefficients are the numbers in front of substances and or mixtures that represent something called mole ratios. The coefficients here show the amounts of reactants required and the products produced. Specifically, the coefficients represent the number of molecules and the number of moles. If you look here, you notice that you, you have no number in front of N2, so that implies that you have one mole of N2 gas involved in this reaction. The, th the coefficient of 3 in front of H2 implies that you have three moles of H2 gas um, involved in this reaction, right? And then finally, the coefficient of two in front of NH3 implies that you have two moles of NH3 gas produced in this reaction. So the coefficients tell you the number of moles or molecules, and those numbers are always in front of the substances or mixtures in any reaction. All right, finally, um, for your practice problems, this may help you with number one, these helpful equations. You may want to write them down or freeze the video and use this while you're answering the questions. And in addition to that, please just answer all the pr other practice questions in addition to number one. See you tomorrow.